When it comes to aesthetics, one muscle almost always tops the list for both men and women. These are the muscles of the core, the midsection, the abs, the obliques. They represent attractiveness, but they also represent incredible athletic physical pursuit. It's true, strong core translates to incredible athletic prowess, just like it does to aesthetics. So today's episode, we're gonna talk about the core, how to develop the muscles of the core so you can look good and move good, so you can perform well. Let's get to the core of it, Sal. I know. I always <laughs> want to use the word prowess. <laughs> prowess. It's a weird. Prowess? Prowess or prowess? Prowess. Prowess. There's a W in there, so I want and, to make sure is, to say the W. And is this true? Is it, is it uh, both sexes? Yeah. It's, it's almost always top five for both men and women is the midsection. Hmm. Part of the reason is because visible like muscles of the midsection show a lot, right? It shows mm. that you're lean. So you have to be lean to see them. You got to be super dialed to get there. Yeah. You, be somewhat, you don't have to be super shredded, but just enough to see that it's, you know, it's lean and strong. And then when it comes to sports, you know, arms and legs, right, uh, are involved in, in most athletic uh, pursuits. But what connects the power from the legs to the upper body allows you to move, stabilize, what allows you to throw with a lot of force in the upper body, uh, or throw with a punch or rotate and catch something mm -hmm. is the stabilization of the core, the strong core. You can have the strongest legs, hips, arms, uh, back, shoulders, but if you have a weak core, you're going to hurt yourself. You're not going to be able to, to, to translate that to athletic performance. So a strong core um, is imperative for all those different things. I still think it's crazy that it's more, you're more likely to become a millionaire than have six-pack abs. Isn't that wild? I think the odds of having a six-pack are lower. Yeah. Then, then to me, that has to be like one of the most fascinating stats that we've ever read I know. on the show is that you're more likely to be a millionaire than have six pack abs. Well, think about this way. If you walk outside, we're in Silicon Valley, right? So millionaires are a little bit high, you know, probably more common. Yeah, but put the whole US in there. I bet still, like you take a hundred people, have them lift up their shirts, random people on the street. How many of them would have a six pack? Not if they're random. Yeah. Zero. Yeah. Probably zero. I, I actually, I bet you it'd be a, a, pretty low percentage even in a gym where you have a massive bias yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. no. that's why I'm, i used to tell members that when i get uh like a new member who was like you know uh you could tell were kind of insecure about their body and how they felt mm -hmm. and and i would stand them up a lot of times and look at i said this this place is not full of all these crazy ripped bodies that people think and most people in here are just like you and i and are in pursuit of a better physique and working on it and it's hard it's not easy like but I, I don't remember reading that stat until later, till we, we got into the, the podcasting when I think you brought it up on the show years ago. And I thought that was the craziest things I've ever heard. And I know, wild, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, I would say to, that part of the reason why it's so rare is it involves like, uh, <clears throat> you, you know, you could have like nice looking arms and have, be at a higher body fat percentage, especially if you're a man because you don't store tons in the arms, legs, you know. But core, you have to be kind of lean. But also... <laughs> You know, I'm going to make a statement. I'd love your guys' opinion on. Um, I would say that of all of the misunderstood, wrong, like you know, applied exercises and poor technique and just just uh, myths around exercise, probably more of them circulate around the core than the rest of the body. Like, oh, there's so a, much. That's a, that's a good. That's a, 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 a pretty good speculation. I think. I yeah. think that. Like how sure, we I'll, treat them completely different than other body parts. Yeah, like they muscles. develop differently. Yeah. Well, I would put him up there with because I, I think before on the show I've talked about glutes being like the number one like uh, muscle that people have a hard time connecting. Sure. I would say abs would be the second. Mm -hmm. I think abs are, are number two. Well, let me ask you guys this: Is it God? Think about this. How often do you see someone doing a a core exercise really properly? Think about that. Very rare. Almost never. Yeah. Almost never. You see a lot of people doing core exercises. Sure. But I almost never see them being done right to the point where that was a selling point for me as a trainer is I walked around the gym and waited for people to work abs because I knew I could show them in three seconds how yeah. to do it right. And then they would just, it would blow their minds on, on how much differently they felt them. Yeah. And for me, I never, I guess it's interesting. It's rare to see somebody like muscular with, with like fully displayed abs as well. It was like, there was a period there where it was like everybody wanted abs so bad that they would just lean out completely without lifting weights. And it was just like, okay, so you got skinny and runner you, you abs. Can display. Yeah. Yeah. Runner, runner abs. abs. Don't count. And I'm just like, <laughs> sorry, no, that's yeah. not as like what we're going for here. All right, everybody, we're giving away maps bands again because we're in launch season for this brand new workout program. Here's how you can win. 
Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Do all those things, and if you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Now, everyone else, these are the final hours for the launch of MAPS Bands, the workout program that only uses resistance bands. If you sign up right now during the launch period, it's $30 off, plus you get two eBooks for free, Ultimate Bodyweight Training Guide and Quick Meals for Health and Fitness. So if you're interested, if you want the discount and the free eBooks, click on the link at the top of the description below or go to mapsbands.com, use the code BANDS30. All right, back to the show. And there's a lot of muscles of the core, but we're gonna we're gonna stick to the, the more common ones because I think if you train kind of these, you're gonna work all the other ones for the most part. Obviously you have the abs, the abdominals. Then you have the obliques, both internal, external. We're gonna combine them into just obliques. Um, and then you have the transverse abdominals, which we'll talk about because I think that's kind of a special muscle uh, that we're talking. And we're talking mainly of the front of the core. The core really represents all the muscles around the trunk, but we're gonna talk about the muscles on the side and in the front. Um, and how to work them and, and, and develop them. Um, but really the actions are, um, you know, obviously flex, flexing the spine laterally to the front. We'll get to the specifics. But a lot of the importance of the core muscles is to stabilize and allow power transfer. So stabilization would be like, if I'm throwing a ball as hard as I can, my core has to stabilize so that I don't twist, my body doesn't mm -hmm. just twist off it, <laughs> off of itself. It's right? anchoring and grounding you to the earth. Anti-rotation. Yeah. Anti-rotation. It's, you know, we're, because we're, we're primates that walk on two limbs, the, I mean, if you look at like most common places for pain, it's the low back. And it's because um, it's a vulnerable area because we walk on two legs and that the core has to be able to, when you walk, if you look at someone walking or running, you'll notice that that the opposite arm moves from the opposite leg. So, so like, for example, try walking right now, <laughs> yeah. right leg forward with your right arm forward. Have you ever tried to do that? <laughs> yeah, he is <laughs> like a robot, like a weird man. It doesn't, yeah, there's, there's counterbalance, counter rotation. The core is transferring all of that and it needs to be strong and stable. Every time you stand up, sit down, pick something up, um, those muscles have to be, because the spine, you take your spine out, it'll just flop over in whatever direction gravity tells it. So it's all those muscles around the core that protect it and keep it stable and allow for power transfer. So for, I mean, for purposes of lifting, you want to get strong in big lifts like the overhead press or the deadlift or the squat. Yeah. Uh, you better have a strong, stable core. You want to get good at, you know, uh, sports besides the technique, well, you better have a strong core. And then if you want to look good on the beach, that's the muscle that the opposite sex tends to um, notice the most. Well, and, and too, and that's sort of uh, in contrast to what you're talking about in terms of what people like want to pursue this look where they don't really consider the obliques as much yeah. and, and they don't really consider a lot of those tr like twisting transverse type movements uh, that will like boost your strength performance and all of that. Um, and it's really just like the pursuit is, is to like decrease the size of the waist overall and to be able to display your abs as like the six pack. Yes. So, but yeah, the obliques totally underrated muscle, like very important, super impressive. Uh, and, um, it's, it, it definitely stands out and chisels out like your whole midsection. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to the obliques. Yeah. Um, but you're, you're, it's funny when you look at Greek uh, sculptures and statues, they base those statues and they were like Hercules, right? They like, or, um, David, right. They would sculpt them based off of the high performing athletes that they saw or soldiers of the day. Same thing with the Roman statues, right? Off the gladiators. Well, you'll always know about notice as, as well-developed core muscles, especially obliques because really strong people don't have abs and no obliques. Like we try to do with yeah. bodybuilding, right? It's they have well-developed obliques because they're so important. Um, but let's start with the abs. And as we go through this, what we're going to do is we're going to talk mm. about the two, the, the, the points of attachment of muscles and then the way the muscle fiber fibers run, because that'll tell you how to train them, how to train them and what a muscle, what a muscle ends up doing. So if you have two points and a muscle attaches on one point and another point and the fibers run straight between them, when that muscle contracts, it pulls those two points closer together. So if you look at any anatomy chart and you look at muscles, you can pretty much figure out what that muscle does when it contracts because it'll pull those two points together in the direction of the muscle fibers. So with the abs, um, without getting specific, just general, the attachments are the, the rib cage, the, the lower rib cage and the pelvis. So they attach here and here. And when they contract, they bring the pelvis closer to the rib cage. They do what's called, um, 
flexion of the spine. Now, what they don't do is flexion at the hips. This is where people screw up. So anytime you see someone doing sit-ups or crunches or ab exercises, they think just bending forward or bringing the legs up works the abs. The abs stabilize, but they're not really working in a full range of motion. What the abs do when they work in a full range of motion is they bring the rib cage closer to the pelvis. It rolls you up. That's the full action of the abdominals, but they also stabilize the spine. So you want to pick exercises that do both if you really want to develop them. Now, why would you explain to a client that our hip flexors tend to take over a lot of exercises like this for people? Is it more that they don't understand how the abs work? Or do you think it's because the hip flexors are just overactive because of their daily use? And then when a movement like that occurs, they just default to the, the hip flexor. We, we don't do a lot of full range of motion ab exercises in everyday life or movements, mm -hmm. but we do work our hip flexors because we walk. So when you tell someone to lift their legs up, like on a hanging leg raise, which is a very hard <clears throat> ab exercise, mm -hmm. they, they know to get their legs up. And what they do is they just automatically turn on those hip flexors and bend at the hips. Um, and when you do it, try to do a sit up, they'll, do, they'll even do the same thing. You'll see them sit up with this real upright posture because it's all hip flexors. Yeah. And so. I think too, like <clears throat> I could compare it, I guess, like a squatting versus hip hinging movements. Like there's a clear distinction there. That's like a little bit of a hard, um, transition to, to educate somebody like how to hip hinge versus like how to squat down and. Um, because like a lot of natural inclination is to just, you know, squat their way down and to be intentional, uh, with, um, maximizing the pull. So you get more, uh, stretch out of the, the hamstring for instance, or, um, be able to like focus just completely on that. I think it's the same with the abs in terms of like, you know, what, what, what's your desired outcome? You're trying to, to contract the abs at, at their, their full capacity. So you have to be able to treat it like you said, from point to point and, and shorten that, that range. Yeah. So. And, and, and use the same things that you understand about the rest of the body, yeah. like tension and rep ranges that yeah, build. So you got to literally curl up like a ball yes. to, to be able to make that happen. Yeah. But rep ranges and, and, te and tension, I mean, what builds biceps builds your abs too. So there's a lot of myths around like you got to do hundred reps. Like, no, same thing. Like with your biceps, you keep the reps in, in within the muscle building ranges, which is low to like 20, 25. I think that's one of the biggest myths that were out there. Yeah. I think that was at least that's what I believe. Even in my early years as a trainer, same. Uh, you know, th th there's this idea that, oh, your, your calves and your abs uh, are, have can take more of a beating because you use them all day long constantly. And oh, so yeah. therefore you should do even more repetitions to get them to build. And the truth is I actually, when I figured out that that was not true, uh, saw the greatest results going the opposite direction because you rarely ever see anybody train five or eight reps in abs, just like you ever see anybody do five or eight reps in calves. You never see anybody do less than 20 reps for abs. Right. Yeah. Both those. I, and I felt like the, the greatest gains I saw in both those muscle groups came from actually focusing on heavy training and mm -hmm. slow and controlled and only doing five reps, I saw a huge difference in my abs and my calves because I had all my life thought that I needed to be doing all these supersets and 20 reps yep. and 50 reps, 100 reps, like completely the opposite. Same here. I did. Uh, I went for years thinking I didn't have good core genetics and I have to get shredded to really see them to figuring that out, doing decline sit-ups really slow. So I'd roll myself up and only be able to get like really slow, good, like eight reps. And mm -hmm. my abs grew to the point where my abs now are one of my strongest body parts. That was over the course of like seven months of training. Literally how big of a difference I made wow. uh, uh, it, to my physique by doing that. So yeah, tension, reps. But you got to have perfect form. You have to have perfect form in order for this to work. Um, now, some of the best exercises for people are the ones they think encourage good form. Like uh, there's a movement called that that I called hip flexor deactivators. We actually did a video um, on YouTube, an old one. I used to teach clients that exercise because it helped them to engage the abs without engaging the hip flexors. Mm -hmm. And then the next step, which I still to this day, it's one of my favorite exercises, are physio ball crunches. I like physio ball crunches because you wrap your body around the ball so you get full extension. And then if you keep your hips in place, <clears throat> so you don't rock back with your hips, so you keep them in place, it's a full ab crunch or full ab sit up. It's a full range of motion exercise. If you do physio ball crunches right with the full range of motion, especially if you keep your hands here up by your head or above your head, like long lever crunches, even people with really strong cores, like 10 reps, so you're going to get a phenomenal uh, uh, exercise. Or so uh, squish the bug happened. It was like one of the be best cues I ever gave a got a got from somebody. I can't remember where I originally heard that from, um, but I remember teaching 
that before you actually. So you know everybody knows how to do a traditional crunch, um, where you sit down, like lay down on the ground, your knees are bent at about a forty five degree angle or whatever like that, and you're you're just crunching up. But when you do that short range of motion like that, and your hip flexors are overactive, it's like hardly any ab work whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And you'll see everybody has like this kind of natural arch in their low back where you can fit your hands uh, in that gap. Oh, yeah. And so cueing people to flatten, flatten their back. And mm -hmm. all they're really doing is they're they're rolling, they're basically deactivating their hip flexors because you roll the pelvis like and this. activating the abs. Yeah. But it's such an easy cue for a client who doesn't understand how to, you know, deactivate their hip flexors or roll their pelvis. You just say, pretend like there's a bug in, on your low back and try and squish that bug. And that automatically rolls that pelvis, activates the core. And then when they crunch, they get a better contraction. Yeah. I think that's been one of the best cues I've ever given I, um, I like for people, especially people who are learning how to do do this um, or activate their their abs fully. I like reverse crunches better than traditional crunches. Mm -hmm. Reverse crunches are harder to do wrong mm -hmm. than a traditional crunch. So that's usually where I would start people is I have people lay flat on the floor um, and they would just I just bend their knees. You and can sort them. of bypass that whole like yep. hip flexor issue that way too. Yep, yep. Love that exercise. And then advanced would be like a leg raise, but a good ab leg raise does not look like the at leg raises you see people doing in the gym. No. In fact, very few people could do them properly because they're hard. But what it looks like, if you're hanging from a bar or you're supporting yourself by your elbows, yes, you lift your legs, but it's the pelvis that rotates the legs up. It's not the legs bending up at the hip. So it looks like you're coming off the bench and giving yourself like this long lever reverse crunch with a mm -hmm. lot of resistance is what, is what it is. Really strong abs. I mean, at my peak, I was getting like 10 good reps. So this is a high uh, tension exercise, but it can really build the abs right if you do them properly. Then we get to the obliques, the sides of the core. Um, and the obliques are, I mean, the attachments, again, the rib cage on the side, the pelvis on the side. But if you look at the way the muscle fibers run, they kind of run diagonally. The internal and external obliques uh, both run diagonally in different directions. That means when they crunch or they when the muscle uh, contracts, it rotates the body. It rotates and twists the body. So some of the best exercises for full oblique development are cable chops or mm. twisting crunches, things that rotate your trunk, not your, not just your body. Cause I see, see some people doing this where they twist, but you see the whole body twisting. You literally have to rotate the trunk. Then you're going to hit those obliques uh, with that kind of full range of motion and really develop. That. Now when doing that exercise, one of the best cues I'd learned was learning to resist the way back. Cause the common thing someone yeah. sees a wood chop is they swing just like if they were to swing a baseball bat and then they let the cable kind of swing them back. Totally. Um, same rules apply. Just like we talk about building your biceps, uh, if you neglected the eccentric portion of the exercise, you'd be missing mm -hmm. out on one of the best ways to build your biceps. The same thing goes for building your core, your abs, your obliques. Um, that exercise is, I think, one of the best exercises you can do for your obliques. But one of the things that people miss out on is the resisting of that on the way back in yes. the wood shop. Yeah, definitely. And I think step one is anti-rotation. And that's, yes. that's really like... in. Two, again, this is sort of like you'll feel it just like you would. Your abs are stabilizing you when the hip flexors are doing work. Mm -hmm. Same with this to where like if I'm just holding a position and I'm loaded on one side, you're really going to feel uh, that isometric tension from the opposing oblique, uh, which is good. Like you want to be able to have control, maintain control. Next sort of level to that is what Adam's talking about. Like, you know, really being able to rotate, but then uh, not allowing that force to pull you back and rotate with it. Uh, and then the third phase of that, I would then have a pivot where I then would rotate with it. So yeah, now I'm yeah. doing it more of a sport specific or functional type of a, yeah. you know, that cue that reminds me of, or that progression, I should say, reminds me of the progression that we take someone through a seated row. Mm. When you first are teaching them to be upright, retract their shoulders and you keep them in this kind of fixed position. And then as they become more advanced, they understand the action of the muscles. Then you allow them to go, okay, now take it all, roll the scapula forward, roll the scapula back and you take them through this greater right. full range of motion more range of motion but way. first you got to get them to understand what muscle they're trying to engage i feel the same action is in when you're teaching a wood chop and you're trying to engage the obliques and the abs to resist anti-rotation once they understand that action okay now i can take them in this more athletic movement like you're talking about where it's a greater range of motion i go all the way through. yeah my one of my favorite count like anti-rotation exercise for the obliques would be to stand with a cable with your hands close to your chest and the cable is, is at the side here. So it's pulling me to the side, but I'm standing straight and strong. And then all I do is I extend my arms out in mm -hmm. front of me 
and bring it back. And what that does is I'm lengthening the lever, thus increasing the tension on my bleaks. But the goal is to stay as rigid as possible and then bring it back. So it's more tension, less tension, more tension, less tension. Mm -hmm. But what my obliques are doing are resisting rotation with that more tension. Yep. Now, why is that important? You want obliques to stabilize your spine so you don't literally twist off yourself. That's That can cause, like, if you step off of a curb or you're playing a sport like football, somebody hits you, you don't want your, your spine to just twist all, all the way. You want your obliques to stabilize to prevent that from happening. It also allows you to throw fast and throw hard and to run really well. So th that counter-rotation stabilization, super important uh, for obliques and athletic performance. You know, I brought up the progression and compared it with the seated row. And part of the reason why I want to do that for the audience is because it's, it's an, it just reminds me of another example of what we unfortunately get caught up in online, which is you have like literally three different uh, ways of teaching the exercise that we just explained. And we explained it in like, oh, I would teach the anti-rotational first. Then I would teach yeah. catching it and resisting it on the way back. Oh, then I would take it through full range of motion in a more athletic movement. What you'll find on TikTok and Instagram are these clips of like one trainer bashing another trainer for teaching one of yep. those three as if one is wrong and the other one is more right. And the reality is that yep. that's part of, a part of a progression. I see this a lot in uh, in our, you know, social media culture today of like, you know, putting down other coaches and trainers and trying to, you know, claim that your way is better than other way when in reality, like a lot of times it's, it's a, a situation like that. Yeah. And you know, again, uh, I've seen more, God, this is, I'm thinking about this. There's, I've seen more people who are otherwise muscular and well-developed who have poor core strength and core stability than, uh, than any other muscle I would say. Um, and it's, it's because technique is so off and because you can get lean and still look like you have a developed core and immediately you create a ceiling of potential. Totally. Yeah. You're if it becomes the, if you look, if you can't squat heavy or deadlift heavy or overhead press heavy because it hurts your low back, that, that means your core is not as strong as the rest of your body needs. Yes. That's actually, it should not be, ever be that way. Power is leaking. Your, your power is leaking and you can't, it just can't stabilize your body. It's like trying to put a bunch of weight into the back of a truck, but it's got like really, it's got, you know, shocks made out of paper. Like it, it, you're going to crumple and break. And that means your, that means your strength is worthless. It really does. Like yep. if you can't support it with your state, with your core, your arms and legs might as well be a lot weaker. In fact, you'd probably be safer having weaker arms and legs because God forbid you do exert full power, you're going to hurt your lower back. Mm -hmm. um, I know people who've hurt in the lower back bench pressing because their core is so weak because, you know, you have to brace and they go, oh, my back hurt from the bench press. So, yeah. um, and I, again, I think this is probably with, a, with people who work out a lot and because the technique tends to be off, this is probably one of those top parts of the body that people just misunderstand. Mm -hmm. Next up, the last main muscle would be the transverse abdominals. Now this is like, it's like the body's weight belt. Okay. So when you suck in your stomach, that's what this muscle does. Now here's what's interesting about this from an aesthetic point of view. This in particular with women is an area that I would focus on, especially women who had children mm -hmm. because, uh, and I would get this with women, they'd have a baby and all the muscles of the core have to change their function with the growing baby. And some muscles have to atrophy to allow for room. The transverse abdominus is one of them. You can't pull in your midsection yeah. when you're, you know, eight months pregnant. So it would just atrophy and weaken and it's supposed to, and that's fine. The body figures out ways to stabilize when you're pregnant. Obviously stabilization, you're not going to be as stable as you were when you weren't, but you know, you're okay. But then you have the baby, then you work out. You lose body fat, you get lean, you work your abs, you work your obliques. And then you're like, why can't I get this lower belly pooch to go away? I remember the first time this, this happened, I had a client or a potential client come and ask me about this. And we tested her body fat. She was at 17%. She was lean. Like that's really lean fit. You could see some abs, you could see some obliques. And yet I could see what she was talking about. She had kind of this lower belly pooch. Well, I, 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 talked to one of my experienced trainers. This when I was a new trainer. They said, oh, it's the transverse abdominus. That's the muscle that pulls things in. So she could develop her abs and obliques all she wants, but she's not going to bring her waist and core back in until she strengthens that. And so what, that's what that muscle does. And what is that? Is that like the, the organs and stuff sliding down? Yeah, and, that's gravity pushing yeah. the organs down and out. Uh -huh. and, and if and that because you have not, no, in, because your transverse abdominus, it's made up of 28 different internal muscles that wrap around the spine, right? So if this is super flimsy and weak, the organs are going to slide down and yeah. out. The ability for you to 
keep that tight and drawn in is what's going to keep that from yeah because your abs are attached up here and here so pushing them out this way is kind of easy um so this particular muscle if you want to strengthen it you have to practice drawing in mm -hmm. so on your hands and knees uh, vacuum pose is one of the most effective ways to do this and what's interesting is when i've taken women postpartum and had them try to do this it's fascinating because a lot of them can't even can't even feel it. They can't even connect yeah. Yeah, to this muscle. It's a really hard one to reestablish. Yeah. So we start by standing straight up, have them draw in, and then we slowly move them down to that, you know, uh, hands and, and knees. Oh, that's position. interesting that you start that way because I actually start in the four point maneuver and to, to yeah. use uh, gravity to show them so they can feel it. Because a lot of times that way it creates some sort of artificial resistance. Sometimes when they're standing upright, I feel like they, they can't quite. So what I'll do is I'll have them stand upright. I'll tell them to draw on their belly button. And then as they're standing upright, I'll have them hold that and then try and get in that position and uh, then relax okay. so they can feel it okay, draw. Yeah. Cause I feel Cause sometimes it's like you can't even connect. Yeah. You no, know? if you can't, you can't connect, you can't connect like that. I've, but I mean, the, I found the in the four point maneuver, it's, it's, so that way that the organs are pulling down. And so they feel like, oh, I'm trying to lift. Like this there's back. my belly hanging. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like cat cow uh, is right. like an example. It's kind of a classic one. Yeah. yeah. What it kind of looks like. It's a yoga pose. But when they, when they pull the back up, they have to pull the belly button up towards the spine and, and squeeze and squeeze really hard. Bodybuilders used to do this on stage. Frank Zane was really famous for this. So if you ever, yeah. you know, if people want to know. It's crazy. That's, that's the great, like, just to look at it, like what the human body can do, like to see, you know, that, that clear, like extreme example of like normal flex and then and the vacuum. And it's like, you could get real far back in there and see the ribs really stick out. Yeah. Well, and once you learn to, you know, connect, to the muscle and activate it like that. It's such a, a valuable tool. I mean, there's for like on the plane, right? And uh, like I sort of feel my low backs, and that's actually one of the first things I'll do. I'll kind of pull sit up, brace. And, yeah, pull in my core and then brace, and it'll relieve that. A lot of times people don't realize that's what's happening when you're in a car or in a plane or something like that, and you're re, you're relaxing. Your core is not activated at all, and so all the weight and gravity is pulling or stressing on the spine or your hips or whatever. And simply by drawing that in and activating it, it'll relieve all that, and it mm -hmm. feels so much. So once you learn how to do that, you can control that. You know, learning to activate that throughout the day is a, is a good practice. Yeah, and I remember at one point there was all this debate about wearing weight belts, and one side is like, if you wear a weight belt, it'll it'll reduce activation of the core, make your core weak. And then they came out with those fMRI studies showing um, muscle activation. I think it was. I think it was fMRI um, or or MRI, and they showed, oh no, when you wear a weight belt and you do squats and deadlifts and presses. You still activate the core. If anything, mm -hmm. you activate the abs a little bit more. And so, yeah. every, so then that side was like, see, it's totally fine to train with the belt. It'll it'll Just activate trains you to push out. Yeah. So activating and having a good muscle recruitment pattern are two different things. What a belt does, a good powerlifting belt does, is it creates this external stabilization. And the way your core uses it, if you ever for powerlifters know this because you have to learn how to wear a weight belt and how to use it. Your core, you push out against the belt, and then the belt creates stability. In the real world, without a weight belt, that is not what your so, core does yeah. to stabilize. So if you work. always train with a belt, yeah, you're going to activate your core, but you're going to learn how to stabilize your core in a way that doesn't work without a belt, and you'll actually increase your risk of injury in the real world. So for good core stabilization, um, don't wear a belt. Now, if you're going to compete in powerlifting and you need to wear a belt, then you should yeah. you should train a one. To, if it's to part of the sport, then you definitely want to learn it. Well, right. this I'm glad you brought this up because we actually had somebody in our forum just recently, uh, a female who's going through our powerlifting program, and she asked, because she's never used a belt before, if she should use a belt. And um, there, there was there's, there was some debate from other you know guys that wear a weight belt saying like, oh, you should, or it's uh, great, and this and that. And we all said- Protect your back. We all said, don't. Unless, you, unless you're going to compete- and the competition allows you to use the belt because the belt can be an advantage, right? Yeah. It can you have be to learn how to use it and practice right. with and it. And so then then it makes sense. Okay, train with it so you get good at your competition because now I'm I'm advising you in sport. I'm not advising you as an overall person who's trying to be as healthy as possible. If I'm trying to advise you that way, then I tell you don't use the belt because it is. It's going to train a different recruitment pattern. And unless you're going to walk around with a weightlifting belt in uh, every day throughout the day, mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense for that be the way that you brace. Because one day you're going to bend over to pick a chair up or you know the couch or something heavy, and your body is going to think to push out against the belt that doesn't exist because you're not wearing it right now. And you would much rather have trained it to draw in to support you there which you don't need a belt in order to do that. Right. Okay. So now that we know like bracing involves the core, just stabilizing, tensing, and drawing in a little bit, 
this is a great way to do your stabilization exercises, to practice that, right? Some of the best uh, stabilization exercises involve heavy loaded walking type movements. Oh, Some yeah. of the best. Uh, so overhead carries, carries in the rack position, farmer walks, suitcase carries, holding something heavy, keeping your body stable and strong and tight, bracing the core and walking for steps with that movement, right? That movement and your body having that counter rotation. Excellent stabilization exercises. I would say some of the best stabilization exercises are these ones right here. Then you have the classic like plank, right? Plank, mm -hmm. you can do planks. Planks are also great stabilization. But in, in terms of like applicable, like real world stabilization, nothing in my opinion is better than the, the heavy walk. Well, plank like draw and maneuver, I think is a great place to teach what you're trying to do because to your point about the farmer carries, overhead carries, racks, all these extra... That is going to challenge it in a real world way, but you first need to know how to activate right. it, right? Mm -hmm. And you need to know which. I think that's a, a, a stimulus. Another you. great point that we're bringing up in the show because we do talk a lot about the values of overhead carries and farmer walks, but if you do them and you don't activate the core or uh, brace it right, yeah, or brace it correctly, uh, you're not getting a lot of value out of that movement, right? You're just fatiguing probably your shoulders or your forearms, mm -hmm. your arms that are holding the weight. Um, the main part or the biggest benefits of that exercise is to get yourself into good posture, which by the way, just getting into good posture will also many times draw in the core because in order to er erect to the, spine, the spine, yeah, stack your spine up and get yourself with the chest out and the shoulders back, the core will draw in to hold the spine in that position. And it really exaggerates that when you have anything overhead. So the compensations are a lot more likely to occur and that's why it's so important to start. Uh, you know, with being able to connect and recruit properly because you need to be able to create a safe, stabilized uh, spine before now we like start adding the locomotion where variables get you, um, you know, left to right forces, twisting forces a lot more so than just a straightforward sagittal movement. Yeah. Now, so you, you brought up earlier that, you know, you train the abs like you would train any other muscle, um, your bicep, tricep with as far as the different sets reps, things like that. How do you guys prioritize? Like we, we address like three major functions, right? Of mm. the, the core slash abs. Um, are, are you hitting all three of these specifically in a routine? Are you uh, Monday doing maybe one, one function, Wednesday doing another function, Friday doing another function? Um, I don't think necessarily either one of those is right or wrong, but no. how, how, how do you prefer? I've almost always done uh, the, whole, the core workout uh, all, all at once. And I'll typically start with the stabilization stuff, then move to the full range of motion stuff. So it'll be like, you know, heavy walk, or it would be like stabilization, counter rotation, walks, and then I'll move mm -hmm. to the sit ups and the, you know, which makes sense because you don't want to yep. directly fatigue no, you're doing screwed. full range of motion stuff. And, and then, then you do a heavy over, farmer walk. And yeah, then go yeah. do something no, not where you have to stabilize. Yeah. By the way, if you do ab exercises and your lower back hurts, that's a clear sign that you're using your hip flexors too much because one of the hip flexors, the psoas muscle, actually attaches at the lower spine. And if you're doing like all these leg raises and stuff, you're like, why does it hurt my lower back? That's why that muscle is getting fatigued and will you, where you're going to often feel it is in the low back. The low back is because that's the, the point of one of the insertions or one of the attachments of that particular muscle. So there's, that's like a red flag. I'm doing ab exercise, but my back hurts the next day or, or while I'm doing it. You're not doing the ab exercises right yep. if that is the, the case. Right. So check this out. If you want more free fitness information, we have guides that can help you and they are nothing. They cost nothing. They're free. Go to mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpdestefano. And Adam is at mindpumpadam. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 